Coming up on Twilight, we're live at Interrupt New York 2013. I talked to Glenn Evans, the chief architect. Uh, we talked a little bit about Wi-Fi and uh, who's tracking you? Quiet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 60, recorded September 30th, 2013. Secrets of the Wi-Fi Masters. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Omnilert. Omnilert's mass notification platform allows you to instantly send text messages, emails, and more to your entire organization. For a two-week free trial and 20% off your first year of service, visit omnialert.com slash twit and use the offer code TWIET. Welcome to TWIET This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And I'm coming from the lovely, lovely Javits Center, which this is going to show you right now, in uh, New York. That's right, the Jacob Javits Center, the home of Interop. This is the place where we come to build one of the world's most advanced temporary networks, where we get a team of volunteers, an army of engineers, and just a bunch of geeks who want to play with the latest and greatest in networking technology. And we put it all together into a little thing that we like to call the Interop Net. Now, of course, I am not alone. I'm joined by a fantastic panel, starting with my good friend from the East. Actually, I guess I'm in the East now as well, Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, how are things going on in Florida? Padre, it is a, uh, a gray, lovely late September day in the swamp. Uh, glad to have the rain, but even happier to be part of Twyat uh, talking to you there in the Jacob Javits Center. Looking forward to a great show. That's going to be a great show because you're here. And so, you know, we know you care. But you know who else cares? The lead architect, the chief architect, the guy who puts it all together for Interop, Mr. Glenn Evans. Glenn, thank you very much for coming back on. Padre, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, we have you on every time we come to Interop because you're the man with the plan. You're the guy who actually sits down, decides what's going to be in the network, how we're going to build it, what the timetable looks like. What's it like to be in charge of, well, let's call it the, the, one of the most advanced temporary networks in the world? Well, from my position, it's always very good. I certainly love being in charge. Um, I think most people probably agree with me there. But I think the key thing for me is always, it's the challenge of how do we provide value to the attendees and the exhibitors, and also the guys participating on the Interrupt project. These guys are volunteers. They're spending their training budgets and their vacation time to come here and help us out. And how can we give them something back? And that's always the challenge for me. I know we've covered it before, but I, it, it always bears a little bit of repeating. Interop had really humble beginnings. Tell me a little bit about that cafe in Monterey. Oh, very much so. It, Interop essentially started as a, a vendor test event with, as, as you say, very humble beginnings in Santa Cruz, California. And this is back in the days before Cisco was even thought of. Um, and it was, hey, will your box work with my box? Or we've just written this new protocol. Can we make two machines talk together using that protocol? So it started essentially as a, a group of hobbyists, so to speak, who were trying to get an industry started. And it's grown to what it is today. Right, right. Now, you mentioned, you know, before Cisco came onto the scene, and there are a lot of people, especially young professionals in the field, who do not remember a time before really standardized protocols, when yeah. the equipment from one vendor would not speak to another. And actually, Interrupt grew out of that. And you were part of the, the team in those early days where you had to make this network protocol speak to this network protocol. Yeah. And that's, that's really where the Interrupt idea came from. Now, there are people who say, well, Today, networking is commoditized. You know, every piece of equipment from vendor A will speak to the equipment from vendor B. So why do we still need Interop? Is, is Interop done with? Is Interop obsolete? Now that equipment just works out of the box, do we really need a conference like this? Well, I think, yeah, there's probably a couple of ways to approach that question. Um, firstly, uh, Interop as a brand or an event 
it's really over the years morphed itself from a pure, let's say, down in the weeds technology play into an event that um, targets the you know, the enterprise and sort of to some degree carrier market with the latest concepts in network technologies. Um, now, whether that's you know software defined networking, whether that's virtualization, you know the security components of it. Um, it, it's there to present those sort of concepts to the attendee base. It still has a focus on, you know, the, the underlying hardware or the plumbing of a network, but its focus is more on the applications and the services that the network can deliver. Right, right. Curtis, I want to throw over to you because both of us actually have quite a history with conferences like this. This, this is how we make our bread and butter. This is where we learn what's going on. But there is a generation that doesn't quite understand the conference experience. I, I, I had a chance to speak with some fans of the show who became part of the Inhoff team. And one of the things that, that they were impressed by is the kind of community that builds at these conferences. When you see the same people over and over again, has that conference experience been the same for you? It really has. I think that the conference experience has two entirely separate pieces. One of them is what I like to refer to as the gathering of the tribe. Uh, this is where there, there are any number of people who I know and even consider friends who I generally see once a year at Interop. Uh, that's important that we're able to come together, make face-to-face -face contact, uh, share stories, uh, share what we're working on because it makes the interaction that we have through electronic means, email, instant messages, all the other things throughout the year, much richer and more valuable. The other piece is the chance encounter. The people that I run into at Interop that I wouldn't run into in the course of my daily work, either because we don't live anywhere close together or because we just normally wouldn't have an opportunity to bump into one another. You see that all over a place like uh, Interop, where people are getting together in hallways, getting together outside of conference sessions or in the aisles around booths, comparing notes, sharing experiences, and really having a rich experience that they could not have planned for because they had no idea that other person was going to be there. Now, I, I know that's going to sound a lot like patting ourselves on the back. We're, we're at conferences. We love conferences. We grew up with conferences. But, I, you know, I, I want to give that opposing viewpoint, which is there's very little information that you can get at one of these conferences that you cannot get online, that you cannot get on the Internet, that you can't get away from the conference. So, Glenn, back over to you. For a first-time person visiting something like Interop, learning a little bit about the technology, maybe just going to the expo the first time. What would you suggest for them to actually understand what we're trying to do over here? What do they have to do? What do they have to experience in order for them to actually get something out of coming to a show like Interop? Well, I've, over the last few years, I've sort of maintained that, you know, the true value of the networking at events like Interop and the other ones that we do is not at the technology level, it's actually, as Curtis says, at the personal level, it's personal networking. Um, so, yeah, for the, for the first time, you sort of say, come on in with an open mind and here's your chance to talk to the vendors, talk to the engineers who are perhaps selling installing the various products that you may be interested in or the various technologies and have a chat to them and then go and have a talk to their competitor who may be next door and ask them the same questions and then go away and make your own decisions. Um, it's about, you know, gathering information. Um, and yes, yeah, sure, you can go and get the, the specs and the, let's say, the, the, some of the information on the web but humans, to some degree, are tactile. They need to be physically in front of something or physically see something or see how it operates or see how it interacts um, before they can make that final step into a, a purchasing decision or a, a technology decision for, for something down the road. Now, Castle Bravo in the chat room, he brings up a point that, uh, you know, I think it's worth mentioning. He, he states, and I know he's being a little bit uh, snarky here, that Interop is all marketing for the vendors selling stuff. And, you know, that's true. This it, It's marketing. I mean, we, we are marketing, right? Oh, very much so, yeah. You, you look at the booth on the show floor, it's funded by the vendor's marketing department. 
Um, but one of the things I think the differentiators with Interop is yeah, my part of the program, which is the Interop Net, which is essentially a, it's a vendor neutral playground or a vendor neutral lab environment where we put stuff together and there's no marketing, it's pure technology. Um, and we then, as part of our value add to the attendee base, develop an education program about what we do and why we've done it. So yeah, interrupt, yes, at the base level, it is definitely marketing, um, but it has that differentiator of the interrupt net, which is a pure education techno or technology education play. Curtis, let me throw over to you because I, I've heard that before. Oh, it's, it's, it's only marketing. It's just marketing. It's a bunch of companies wanting to sell you stuff. And at its base, as, as Glenn has admitted, that's true. I mean, they want you to come here so that ultimately you'll buy something from them. You'll buy services. You'll buy product. But we treat that, that like that's a bad thing, right? I mean, because along with the marketing comes the ability to, to actually get your hands on gear that otherwise you wouldn't play with, you wouldn't purchase, you wouldn't have, have the ability to talk to engineers who actually put it together. Right, and Interop is a special conference and show in that regard. There are shows out there where the people who come to staff the booths at a show are just, uh, we'll call them lightweight marketing people or, or even spokes models who, who know some of the key words about the product and, and know the product numbers and names. But if you start asking questions, about all they can really do is hand you some literature. At Interop, the companies are much more likely to bring engineers to the show because they know that the attendees are going to ask some pretty serious questions about what's going on under the hood. They respond to that by bringing the right people. And so I think that Interop is a great opportunity to have those in-depth conversations that it's really difficult to have outside of a very special instance in your place of work. And it's almost impossible to have in the kind of variety you can have at Interop. Uh, you know, it's just not that often that you can compare three, four, five competitor offerings within the span of a few minutes. Interop lets you do that and do it by talking to engineering staff, not just salespeople. Glenn, I want to go back over to you. We've got a, actually a decent set of questions from Max1234 in our chat room. He says, how does Interop push the vendor for newer technology? And uh, what's the other one? How does Interop test their engineers? How do we make sure that we're getting engineers who actually know their stuff? I think this is especially good since we're dealing with a new vendor who we'll be actually interviewing in the third segment, Ekahau. Uh, and I think that that uh, that's actually a good place for you to, to come in and actually talk about what we're trying to do other than just market. Sure thing. You know, obviously, yeah, my area of expertise is the interop net, which is the underlying technology layer uh, that runs or drives the interop event. So all exhibitors, all attendees will plug into this network that we build. But part of our the concept of building the network, yes, it has to. It's, it's a basic transport network. But we're, as we're we're looking to sort of demonstrate new technologies, new concepts. We're always out there looking for new things. Now, obviously, one of the big things in the news at the moment is the Bluetooth low emission eye beacon type concepts or technologies. You know, we're trialling a similar sort of concept, but using uh, Wi-Fi technology. I believe you've got Ekahau or something like that coming up a little bit later. That was a company that, you know, we saw this Bluetooth or the, the beacon type concept come out. But like, okay, how can we apply that to the interop net within our, let's say, design parameters? You know, we have our own Wi-Fi network that's stable, reliable, and you know, relatively fast. Okay, let's leverage that to try and provide some of these supposed benefits of real-time location services. So we're trying to push the envelope in that sort of aspect. And yeah, you know, I'm probably the first to admit that you know, base networking. You know, these days is relatively boring. So, okay, what do, can we do to make it a little bit more interesting? And for me, it's about, you know, network control. So, you know, I look for companies that are pushing software-defined networking concepts. Now, whether that's short of the path bridging, trill, open flow, doesn't really, I don't really care as long as they're trying to push those sort of control boundaries. And they're the sort of companies we look for when we're designing and building the interrupt net.
Uh, Glenn, uh, let me go back to a more basic question, and that is, how does the interop net work? Because it's not as if, okay, well, if you're at interop, if you're a vendor, automatically you can participate in the interop net. Uh, very good question, yeah. We basically work on an, um, an RFP process that usually goes out about two or three months before the show cycle starts. And that RFP is created to try and drive innovation, drive attendee value on the expo floor. We look, go out and essentially say, hey, listen, guys, we need to build, we're building a network that all the exhibitors and attendees will connect to, but we want to make it interesting. We want to make it challenging for the people who are going to build it. And then we want to be able to build an education platform around what we're doing. And so we then get the vendors to come back with their, their ideas. Now, in some cases, it may be something that, the, that they haven't released yet. So, you know, you don't see the information on the web, but we are going to get it in two or three months time. So we're able to get you know, early access to some of the newer technologies and newer concepts coming out. And we'll then build those, in, or design the interrupt net around those. Curtis, this is sort of a lost art uh, in IT, in enterprise IT. And that's that idea of getting the best vendors. I, I mean, from your take, I mean, from what you hear at Enterprise Efficiency, the most popular solution is just to pick a vendor, maybe pick two vendors and just take every bit of the network from them. I mean, there's, there's no real work to say, well, we want this piece and this piece and this piece because it's best practices. It's just give us a single vendor so we can sign one contract and get it done, yes? Oh, absolutely. A lot of uh, executives and admins, the, the rather indelicate term they use is a single throat to choke. Uh, they want someone that they can hold responsible. And frankly, they want a vendor who will take responsibility for making everything work together. Now, in some cases, that's going to be someone like a system integrator, but often it is a hardware vendor. Uh, and that's a shame. You know, over my career, I've watched us as an industry go back and forth between this idea of the integrated solution all coming from one vendor and the best of breed solution where you pick and choose. I think what a lot of people have decided is that while the best of breed solution is probably the best for overall performance, the single vendor is mighty good when it comes to getting a sound sleep at night. And, uh, you know, a good night's sleep is a really valuable thing when you're on the network desk. Uh, Glenn, we hate sleep at Interop, so that's why we, we use multiple vendors. But we actually have a really good question in the chat room from Cake Interface, who says, how do we ensure that all the different vendors that we invite into the Interop net are provided the protocols that they require to make their products work? Um, you want to explain a little bit about the monster of VLANs that we have at Interop? Um, Oh, okay, how do we answer this one? Um, be, I've got to be a little bit diplomatic here. Um, essentially, you know, the interrupt net and with the vendors that play in, let's say, for want of a better phrase, the sandpit, um, are all on a level playing field. Um, we don't favour one over the other. They all have to interact. And that, it's part of that is, it's part of a culture that we've built over many years where we have a lot of, you know, alpha egos um, and it's, a, yeah, we've built a culture where, listen, everybody's right. Everybody has a part or a say in what goes on and how we do things. Um, but ultimately, somebody's got to make a decision. So for want of a better word or better phrase, it's a democratic dictatorship. And all the vendors come in and they, we give them some basic guidelines you know, around that sort of premise. And then let them do their thing. But also make them aware that Listen, whatever you do, you are going to affect a number of other vendors. So please be, be thoughtful about what you're doing and also have those other vendors participate in what you're trying to do. So it's a very much, a, it's a, certainly a collaborative process. Um, and then we have to make sure, listen, what do you need to be successful? Because after, at the end of the day, these guys are donating their time, their equipment um, and their energy to make this happen for us. And so we want them to be succeed, to succeed. So one of the questions is, you know, what do you need to be successful? Okay, and then we we then work out how do we provide that. Um, and the fact that you know a lot of vendors keep responding to the RFP and keep wanting to be involved, I think speaks to the fact that yeah we do actually succeed 
um, in meeting their expectations and allowing them to de and allow them to demonstrate their product or their technology or their concepts in the best light. Actually, we've got OS Junkie in the chat room who's saying information can't always be shared between vendors. This is something that you run into a lot, right? Yeah. Because the vendors behind us, these people, these engineers who are working yeah. behind us, they're naturally enemies. They compete against each other. So yeah. how is it that we can expect them to come into a situation like this and say, listen, open your books, yeah. tell us how this really works so we can make our gear, talk to your gear and give you what you yeah. want. Yeah, we have, um, you know, I suppose what we term a blanket N NDA. Um, what ha and it's a bit like you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's what happens on the interop net stays on the interop net. Yeah, we're all here to work towards a common goal. Um, if a vendor fails, we all fail. So it's in our best interest to make sure that everybody succeeds. And it's a, it's a cultural thing. Um, it's a, an unspoken or unwritten sort of a rule that, yeah, we want full access, but we, and we want to be able to get in there and help you out. If you have a problem, let us know and we can help you fix it or we can work around it, but we always make sure that we, you know, any sort of little anomalies or issues stay in house and never get out into the outside world. Curtis, I want to kick over a question to you that is also coming in from the chat, chat room that talks about this silofication. That's not a word, I just made it up, but this, this desire to go with a single vendor, which is very counter to what we're doing here. When you say, I don't want to do any of the difficult work to make sure the gear is going to talk to each other, I'm just going to go with the single easy vendor. It does create a silo effect, right? I mean, you, you are now dependent on that vendor. You, you cannot use any other competing standards. You cannot use any other competing equipment if you want to get the maximum return on investment. So it, wh how do, how do you, you struggle with that? How do you have on one hand the desire to have everything as neat and easy as possible, and on the other hand, not wanting to work a weakness into your IT? Well, I think that for most companies, the way it breaks down is trying to decide where their priorities lie and where they can afford to make trade-offs. Uh, you have some executives who have a philosophical bent that leads them in the direction of diverse vendors. Uh, these are people who want to optimize away from the idea of a single point of failure even if that single point is not um, architectural, but vendor related. Others believe that they can get the greatest return and wring the greatest concessions from a vendor if they do go all in from one vendor. They can get a lot of support for their particular need if they tell a vendor, hey, we're gonna buy everything from you, but we're going to require some engineering help some pre-sales, some pro-sales, some integration. And if the check that's going to be written is large enough, most vendors are happy to say, why, sure. It really does come down to philosophy. And in the same way that we have seen uh, people on the database side go to various SQL versus non-SQL choices, people on server sides go either uh, from commodity white boxes or choose everything from a single known hardware vendor, the question of which decision fork the executive is most comfortable with is going to come down on their willingness to take risks and where they're willing to take those risks. It varies everywhere and it's always fascinating to see the choices that an executive makes and try to decide if you can work back to their underlying philosophy from those. Now, uh, Glenn, I gotta, we got to close this out because we have to move on to the next segment. We've got some really, really good questions in the, in the chat room. I think what we need to do is invite you back and just do an ask me anything. Uh, you know, Let them ask you about sure. how the program works, how we let the vendors fight it out, how, what happens every time there's a conflict. But I want to leave with this. You mentioned that Interop is a democratic dictatorship. And I guess that would make you the dictator. Well, the interop net is a democratic dictatorship. It's a democratic dictatorship. So from the dictator, the mouth of the dictator, what do you want to see interop become in the next cycle? You know, let's just look out over the next year. We do Las Vegas and New York. We do both coasts. What kind of new technologies do you want to drag in? Do you want to attract? We've had a great history of bringing out some very new gear before it becomes mainstream. 
What do you want Interop to be known for in the following cycle? Well, that's a very timely question. We're actually in the middle of writing the RFP for the 2014 season. And I suppose I'm sort of looking at maybe taking a couple of steps back on some levels and two or three steps forward on other levels. Um, what it might, I think my goal, and it's probably going to be a two-year goal for this cycle, is to try and have a, a stable base network platform with, a, let's say, two-year partnerships with some vendors that we can then build you know, applications and services on top of. Yeah, yeah, wireless location services, maybe some sort of Bluetooth LE type scenario. Get a bit smarter or get a bit more creative about network control and monitoring and performance um, and the tools that are built around those. Perhaps try and do some more with either A, network virtualization or virtualization concepts sitting on top of the underlying transport. Um, so it's, I think it's, it's going to be our creativeness is going to happen at a couple of layers above the network level. So it's where we sort of spend a lot of time you know, building a network and tuning it um, you know, and trying not to break it. I think my idea for the next season is have a stable platform to work from and then get more creative in the, let's say, you know, the application and services elements. So basically, get a lot of really cool hardware and then let's see if we can break it. Yeah, yeah, I like okay, that. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Glenn Evans from Interopnet, thank you so very much for coming back on. Cheers, Padre. Thanks it's very much. It's always a pleasure. You know, and thank you, Curtis. Thank you, Curtis. Now, right after the break, I'm going to show you a little bit about 802.11 standards. Specifically, we want you to know everything you need to know about 802.11. But before that, I want to take a moment to talk about our first sponsor. Now, we're here in New York, we're here at Interop, we're all about communications, which is why I'm absolutely, well, just wonderfully a titter that we have OmniAlert as a sponsor of the Twilight Riot. Now, OmniAlert is a way for you to get all your important communications out when you need. You see, every organization needs an effective way to communicate during important situations. 7.5 million people and over 15,000 organizations have already found that OmniAlert is the perfect solution to their critical communication needs. You see, OmniAlert's cloud-based platform enables managers to distribute simultaneous text messages, phone calls, emails, desktop alerts, and more. OmniAlert can even update web pages, social media pages, digital signage, and countless other devices or services. Or organizations around the world have been able to fill their critical communications need with OmniAlert, including hospitals, fire departments, and other emergency services, which use OmniAlert to replace one-way pagers, delivering critical information and summoning first responders when they need them. Universities and colleges use OmniAlert to report campus crimes and notify students in case of emergencies. K-12 schools have used the service for everything from automated attendance calls to reporting lockdowns and notifying parents about things like health problems and snow days. Sports teams and community groups use it when they need to cancel and postpone events due to weather or other unforeseen circumstances. And companies, both large and small, use it to notify employees about everything from server downtime to local traffic conditions. In other words, emergency or just information that needs to get out to the people that need to know, OmniAlert has the product for you. Now, OmniAlert can be administered from any desktop, smartphone, or laptop. There's no software that you have to install. Their interface lets you import users easily, even letting them opt in via a text message. And you can send messages to all users or set groups and select contact methods, receive inbound tips and real-time reporting. You can set up trigger action sequences, which would include website updates, mass text messages, phone calls, social media calls, and conference calls, just to name a few. If it's a way to communicate, OmniAlert can use it. Now, we know it's not just for emergencies. OmniAlert can inform people in your organization about weather conditions, IT issues, email or servers being down. In fact, Twit uses it to inform our employees anytime there's going to be a traffic alert. OmniAlert invented the world's first campus emergency notification system, and it's the leading brand for colleges and universities, recognized as an industry leader by FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security. Now, I know that you might be worried about exposing your database. After all, these are your contacts, your employees, your students. But OmniAlert understands that your emergency contact information is, in, is sacred, so they protect their interface with a 2048-bit SSL certificate. 
They also provide hassle-free customer support, available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, with prices as low as $2 per user per month on the basic plan. Now, OmniAlert can help you eliminate emotion and stress. You get to plan scenarios ahead of time before they become emergencies. And when the time comes, you can deliver information with one click. Now, over 98% of OmniAlert's customers renew their service each year, including the American Red Cross, UNICEF, DuPont, Pratt & Whitney, Phillips, Mazda, Bayer, Cal Poly, and even Petaluma High School Baseball. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to experience OmniAlert's award-winning critical communication services for your organization. For a two-week risk-free trial and 20% off your first year of service, visit OmniAlert.com slash twit and use the offer code TWIET. That's OmniAlert.com slash twit, offer code TWIET. And we thank OmniAlert for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Now, Curtis, are you ready for some Wi-Fi mojo? Padre, I can think of nothing better on a great Monday afternoon than some serious Wi-Fi mojo happening. Well, let's get mojified with stuff, my IT guy says. I'm Father Robert Balasser, the Digital Jesuit, host of Twilight, this week in Enterprise Tech on the Twit TV network. We're here at the Interop Hot Stage Warehouse for another edition of Stuff My IT Guy Says. This time I'm sitting next to Mr. Mike Rydalk. Mike, thank you very much for talking to us. Yep, glad to be here. You're, uh, you're from Xerus. You've been on the show a few times because, well, you just know everything about the wireless. And that's what we're talking about, wireless alphabet soup. You know all those little letters you see after the standard 802.11 A, B, G, N, A, C? Mike's going to tell us all about them. Tell me a little bit about the first two letters, B and A. And they actually do come in that order, right? Yes, they do. And B and A were both ratified very similar time frames in 1999. B supports up to 11 megabit data rate. A and B is in, two point, in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. A is in the 5 gigahertz spectrum, and it supports up to a 54 megabit data rate. Now, there are a lot of interesting give and takes between the two standards, but they really form the core, the foundation of every wireless standard that comes after because they were the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz uh, technologies upon which Wi-Fi is formed. Now, give me a little bit of a comparison between the strengths and the weaknesses of 2.4 versus 5 gigahertz and vice versa. Five, uh, 2.4, some of the strengths are uh, it will generally propagate further, and right. that's because of the the, the wavelength. Mm -hmm. uh, five g or two point four, so better coverage. Some of the uh, downside of that is um, the number of channels. Now let's talk about those channels because I still have people who write me and say, "Oh, you're always talking about how there's only three channels, but in my AP or in my client, I see eleven or I see fourteen. What's the deal? Are, are there three channels or are there 14 slash 11 channels in 802.11b? There, there is a, 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 some chunk of spectrum in the 2.4 band worldwide that's carved up into 14 5 megahertz wide channels. What we talk about, the three channels, well of those 14, only 11 of them are, are usable in the U.S. But of those 11, in the 802.11 spec, in the 2.4 B, G, and N uses uh, a 22 wide 22 megahertz wide yeah. channel. So let's do the math. Five, yeah. five megahertz wide, wide channels, 22 megahertz of usage, which means that it, it actually overlaps, right? You yes. go over channels. So our magic numbers are 1, 6, six. and 11. If you're using anything other than that, it, you're not actually getting a different channel, right? You're, you're really overlapping. In fact, right. uh, if you look at the signal in a, in a signal analyzer, you can see the curve. And if those curves touch from, from different devices operating in supposedly different channels, you're getting interference, which means you're retransmitting, which means your data rate goes down. Yes, okay. you will see a significant performance degradation if, for example, you use channel one and channel three. Yeah, because they're right next to each other. Now let's go over to five gigahertz. Five gigahertz, I've heard, are, have, have 21 channels. Now, do you get that same overlap? I mean, if, if I put something in channel 38, and something in channel 39, am I, am I going to see those two waves touch? Right. I mean, for example, channel 36, channel 40, 44, and 48. There is, to answer your question, there is 21 channels. 
but in five giga in the five gigahertz spectrum they're non overlapping uh -huh. so you can use channel 36 and channel 40 on two radios that are within rf ear range of each other and they're not going to co-interfere with each other i like that so in the b spectrum in, in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum we've got 14 or 11 channels in the united states with only three that are non-overlapping whereas in the five gigahertz spectrum you've got 21 channels 21 non-overlapping yes which okay. becomes very important when you're doing rf reuse and trying to build out a good proper design of a wireless network now let's push it a little bit forward uh, forward because we know that 2.4 gigahertz, gigahertz propagates better. It goes through walls. I mean, you've seen that. If you've got a dual band router in your home or in your office, your B signal always goes further than your A signal. And that has to do with the way that those waves propagate because five gigahertz actually has a smaller wave, correct? That's, that's correct. The wavelength in 2.4 is roughly five inches. It's roughly three or a little bit less in five gigahertz. The other side of that, with the difference between B and A is the data rates. B goes clear down to a data rate of one, therefore mm -hmm. the uh, modulation techniques that are used actually carry further. So mm -hmm. that's another reason why you'll see that in the 2.4 that seems to connect, connect you further than the five gigahertz. So that's the start of our alphabet soup. And then we move over. Here we have a device that does only 802.11b, so only 2.4 gigahertz. Here's a device that does 5 and 2.4 gigahertz, but only 802.11b and a. Here are devices that do 802.11g, so 2.4 gigahertz, b and g. And then this one does, I believe, a, b, g, and n. That's correct. So dual band. As we move forward, what do we see in the data rates? I mean, uh, we, we said at the very beginning that all the technologies are based on the B and G standards. Uh, how is that? When I look at G or when I look at N, what am I really looking at? Well, for example, we talked about 802.11b. Its maximum data rate is 11 megabits. When we move to having some A technology at the same time, that was a 54 megabit uh, data rate technology. In 2004, 802.11b, G was ratified, and that's in the 2.4 band, but now that's a 54 megabit data rate. Then, as we moved along in time and was able to, uh, in 2007, or 2009, 802.11n was ratified, and depending on the uh, spatial streams, how much frequency you use, whether you're doing channel bonding, you can go up to a three, uh, 450 megabit data rate. Right. And now none of these devices support the newest kid on the block. That's 802.11ac. And 802.11ac is actually not just building up on the foundation of the old B and A devices. It incorporates a few new technologies, things like the, the, the ability to truly talk to multiple devices rather than slicing up your, your radio time between them. Are we seeing the next generation of Wi-Fi with AC, as, I, as I've often heard it called, is it not just a building up on old technologies, but really sort of a reimagining of what Wi-Fi does? Well, what it is, is it's, it's taking advantage of the throughput capacity of a single radio. Because as we talked about uh, a single channel being 22 megahertz wide, what you get with N, you can actually bond and have 40 megahertz wide channels. With the first wave of AC, we'll be able to bond 80 megahertz worth of spectrum and channel and you know in that case four channels wide on a single radio so we continue to scale what the capacity of a single radio does okay now last question and that is should someone only be looking for the last standard you see this all the time whenever they advertise specs for you know new laptops new devices it'll say oh i support 80211 uh, BGN or I support 802.11ac. If, if I get the latest letters, does that mean that that's all I need, that's all I want? Just just buy the latest letters and be done with it? Um, two, two things of, of guidance there. If, you, if you're buying a device and you only care about 2.4 gigahertz, if it says BGN, that means it supports 2.4. If it says ABGN, supports 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, and if it support, says it supports ABGNAC, it's going to support to the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. And if it only says AC, it only supports 5 gigahertz. More than likely. We're not quite, AC is not ratified yet, mm -hmm. and I've not seen a device that says only AC. But if it did only say AC, you need to realize that's probably only going to support ANAC devices in the 5 gigahertz. Mike, thank you very much for talking to us. It's, it's always a pleasure to have you on. We'll have you back when uh, the new AC devices come out. But until then, I'm Father Robert Ballas here, 
and you've just been learned. So I've, uh, I was watching the chat room and some people were saying that was still a little bit too advanced. I'm hoping that we can get down to a more basic level that people actually understand how the 802.11 standards work. Curtis, let me throw over to you for a second here. 802.11 wireless has become sort of ubiquitous. People just expect it to work. And it wasn't too long ago that it was really an experimental technology. So how has it moved so quickly into acceptance across consumer and enterprise? Well, I, I think that it's one of those cases where as soon as we saw what the possibilities were, as soon as we saw what it was like to sit someplace and get work done without having to worry about dragging a cable with us, it was one of those aha moments. This is the way networking should be. It took a very short time for the mobility aspects to really take over the, the enterprise and the home. I mean, let's face it. Most home computer users have no desire to go around stringing network cable around their house. Uh, and stringing network cable is a huge expense in the enterprise. Wireless saves money. It increases productivity. There is absolutely no reason for it not to be used. But when everybody used it, all of a sudden, the limitations of B became known. And that started the whole race down the alphabet train to find better, higher bandwidth, higher capacity protocols. And that's what we're seeing today. Better, faster, stronger. That's what we're looking for in Wi-Fi. Of course, my personal preference is still whenever you can. Cable, cable, cable. Now, the reason why we brought up some basics about 802.11 wireless is because our next interview is with a vendor who is dealing most intimately with it. I'd like to welcome Mr. Scott Lampham to the show. He's the Director of Solutions Consulting from for Echohow. Now, Echohow is a brand new company that we brought in here at Interop with some, um, well, I'd say interesting technology. Scott, tell me, what exactly am I holding? What is this thing? So what this is, is this is an 802.11 radio that we use as a uh, active RFID location tag. Uh, it's affixed to a variety of different assets or, or, or equipment that you wanted to be able to uh, locate using just the wireless network. Okay, now I've seen technologies like this that use Bluetooth, low-powered Bluetooth. What made you go with wire, with Wi-Fi instead? Predominantly, the main reason is because, like you'd mentioned earlier, the proliferation of Wi-Fi throughout the enterprise has just pretty much gotten out there to where it's become more of a utility and it's standard pretty much everywhere. Uh, tell me a little bit about Ekahau. Tell me about you. Tell me what's your experience, what's your expertise, what brought you to this company, and why did Ekahau decide that this would be a business model that should be followed? All right. So uh, back in 2000, there were some uh, gentlemen uh, much smarter than I am that uh, realized the uh, forecoming uh, Wi-Fi being really kind of the place to be. So they designed this uh, tag and, and ultimately the solution that we're going to show in just a moment uh, from a real-time location standpoint. Uh, to be able to go through and develop it. There's a, definitely a need for location-based services. Uh, there's a lot of different value and benefit in that. Uh, and, and basically my history is I used to work for a healthcare company that uh, had actually invested in Ekahau. Um, we put it in, we installed it. I was the uh, kind of the program manager within the uh, install, to, um, talked to the customers, got to know what's going on, and uh, were able to be able to utilize the system in a sense that uh, find you know, different, uh, different uses for it, different uh, technology space where we could benefit from location tracking. Uh, became very, very familiar with the solution and uh, really was just kind of ready for a career change. So uh, luckily I was able to come aboard Decahow. All right, now let's get back into the brass tacks. This is a cool technology that we're playing here with here at Interop. Tell me a little bit how this actually works. Okay, so there's multiple ways to, to set the tags up and to get it to utilize the, the RSSI footprint. But what's been generally happening is the tag itself will communicate to the Wi-Fi in a variety of fashions, uh, basically using what we call RSSI fingerprinting. So as it goes through the environment, we're actually reading the network, being able to see what it is. In the case here at Interop, we've, we've partnered with Xeris to be able to do it in what we call blink mode, enabling the network to see the tags in a very, you know, big environment like this with a lot of Wi-Fi signal strength and stuff like that. Uh, the blink mode works really, really well. 
and uh, the tag itself is just basically reporting in an interval that we set and uh, then the wireless network uh, through the back end is kind of giving us uh, the location information that we need to be able to run it through our algorithms uh, to actually determine the location and place it on a map for uh, visual uh, viewing. I got it, I got it. Now, Curtis, let me throw over to you for a second. When you think about technologies like this, how do you see them used in an enterprise environment? I mean, they're cool. I, I love anything that gives location information for my attendees here at the show, but what about the enterprise would want location-based Wi-Fi tags? Well, I think there are a lot of different applications ranging from uh, things like manufacturing and warehousing where you want to keep track of say people and uh, forklifts doing picking off of shelves uh, to small trucking operations around a yard that's a much different set of uh, issues than you get on long distance trucking um, to ultimately things like shopping and shopping carts if you know who is going where? If you can see where all of your shopping carts are congregating, it can give you an idea of what's selling, what you should be stocking, and perhaps where you should have those wonderful people set up to give demonstrations and hand out samples of all the good food to shoppers who are over there. So there are all kinds of, of scenarios where you want to know where different people, both employees and customers are, around your location. I think these are great things. Scott, a little bit about the tech. What about battery life? Because I know the reason why they were experimenting with Bluetooth was because it's it's a low powered technology. Wi-Fi obviously has advantages in range and such, but it also uses up more power. So how does that affect the power capacity of a unit like this? That's a good question and a very commonly asked one. Um, what we're able to do is, is basically the, the radio itself will cycle on and off at whatever periodic rate we set it for. And of course, that is determined based upon the use case that you're trying to do. Uh, and you know, in the instance, if you want something every five seconds real time, obviously the battery is going to last less than if you have it every five minutes. Our tags also have accelerometers in them. So if something's not moving, there's no sense in keep you know keeping it you know, determining the location when it hasn't moved. So we have a, a variety of different settings that can be done uh, for the tag to enable kind of the best case scenario from making sure you get everything you need uh, from a use case perspective, as well as maintaining as long a battery life as you can. And another thing is uh, all of our wearable tags, uh, like the one I'm holding here, which is kind of our staff tag, uh, this is a rechargeable battery. So for people that you typically want to report much more frequently, uh, they are rechargeable and much more easy to do. All right, all right. Let's get into the soup. Show me how this might actually work. I, I believe you have a demonstration of how this has actually been implemented in a hospital? Correct. We actually uh, have a, a kind of a demonstration that we're going to show you that, that is within a hospital environment, shows a couple of different use cases, and I'll definitely talk about uh, some of the things. And what you're looking at right here is kind of our main dashboard from our vision application. Uh, this is what we do that brings kind of the location awareness into the visibility aspect as well as provide, you know, what we like to call business intelligence uh, to be able to make informed decisions on things. So if you look at the screen, you can see such things as the status of an, of an asset or a person depending upon uh, a variety of factors. You can see temperature sensing, which we also do over the Wi-Fi network, uh, whether the tag or whether the temperatures of the refrigeration units or coolers uh, are in, you know, in line with where they're at uh, or what they're doing. And on this screen, you can, you know, save searches and, and set it up kind of in a personalized aspect. And then what, what we're going to do here is kind of show you the visualization of it. This is a really good way of looking for things. Uh, for instance, if you're a, a, you know, a caregiver at a hospital or a school educator or somebody and you're looking for something, you can really quickly pull up a map and see what things are where. Uh, you can once again search for things on here as well. Uh, and, and how we do it is we enable zones and zone groups. So we're able to kind of put together a, a, a meaningful location. So just looking at a map is great, but the meaningful location is there. And what we're looking at here is kind of the historical breadcrumb trail uh, of a particular asset uh, that we wanted to see where all it went through, through a, a dedicated time frame that we wanted to see. Uh, once again, you know, you're looking at the graphical view. 
this is basically the floor maps of a particular area. You can have a building three-dimensionally, many floors, uh, many different buildings within the same set. This can also be deployed in a campus-wide environment or, you know, distributed. And what we're doing here is our B4 tags, which I showed a minute ago, kind of has a messaging capability. So since we are a two-way communicating device, you're able to either send, you know, information to everybody. Let's say there's bad weather in the area or you want to send just a particular person a message for, uh, you know, they need to report somewhere or, or something like that. Um, this will show you uh, kind of you just type in the box over on the right where the actual picture of the tag is and you kind of put in whatever you want sent. I like that. I like that. And this is all happening in real time. Absolutely. So the tag itself is communicating in real time, uh, locating up. Once again, it's depending upon how you configure them, but for staff is very, very quickly. And then the messaging is used for a lot of different things, um, like, uh, you know, notifying of mass, uh, mass notifications as well as, like I said, individual things. It's also good in the workflow process. What we're looking at here is kind of a, uh, all the events and alerts that come in, and we'll get to how, you, how these are created in a minute. But in this particular staff safety event where somebody pulled the B4 safety switch, you can see who pulled it, when they pulled it, where they pulled it, uh, and, and all the documentation that reacted to it. We also have a forensic replay. This enables you to redo something, uh, kind of reenact the event. And this is really good for like drills and tests to be able to go through and validate it, as well as to make sure that people are responding uh, to an event or an occurrence, uh, you know, in a timely fashion that you need. Okay. Okay. Now, exactly how is this working? I know the people in the chat room are wondering about that. All right. So the tag itself is going to, you know, report location and be able to do things. And then in just a minute, uh, and we get into the demo part, we'll be able to see, you know, right now we're looking at some reporting, uh, but it's going to be able to get in and uh, be able to do button presses, location visibility, different different trigger events will proactively notify and create an event. For instance, if an IV pump goes into a certain room or out of a room, or a teacher pulls the lockdown safety switch, uh, kind of alerting everybody. You know, all those are different kind of events and alerts that the system can do. So it, it's far beyond just a true location device. It's really bringing it and, and kind of working it into the workflow and making the life easier for the users. Okay, but but I, I'm not going to let you off the hook there because I want <laughs> I want the secret sauce. Is this using GPS data, accelerometer data? Is it is it actually sensing its presence within a Wi-Fi array? How how does this work? And, and so what it is 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 through using the Wi-Fi signals from the access points, uh, we're able to go through and doing uh, through the initial setup where we learn um, kind of how the network is set up and where it's at, and through great partners like Xeris, we're able to. Uh, basically map out the network so that we are able to use not triangulation but RSSI footprinting. So as we go through and scan, we may see 14 different access points. We may see 12 different access points. Uh, that includes floors above and below. So we get a really good three-dimensional place and space uh, within the enterprise to be able to locate the asset or okay. person. And uh, this, this rule name screen that we're seeing right now, this is setting zones or how does this work? So what this is doing is this is actually setting up the different triggers based upon a variety of different things, whether it be a button press on a tag, whether it be uh, whether something goes into or out of an area. We even do dwell. So if something uh, is sitting still for a period of time, for instance, uh, let's go back to the healthcare example. And let's say you have an IV pump that is not in a patient room, not in you know, not in a soiled room, sterile room, it's kind of misplaced and it sits there for a period of time. Uh, we all know that never ever happens, but in the event that it does, you have the ability to proactively notify uh, whoever needs to know that that equipment is being underutilized. So you would tag people and you would tag equipment. Basically anything that, that is sensitive to location, you would put one of these on. Absolutely. And then, you know, one thing uh, at the very beginning when I was actually a customer, I, I was talking to somebody and somebody had asked me, uh, you know, what, what should we track? And, and in a nutshell, it's everything that moves and everything that you don't want to move. Um, <laughs> because with these accelerometers, like I said, you can do a, a, an event based upon um, a motion. So if it sits still and then all of a sudden it just uh, it decides that somebody's going to move it or whatever, you can get notified. For instance, once again, uh, in healthcare, you have a crash card. Every time it moves, you're going to notify quality and other people to make sure that things are, you know, taken care of correctly after the fact. Okay. Okay. Now this is not just a location device. This can also be 
a, like a two-way page or emergency device, right? I mean, I, I think when you first showed this to me, the first thing I thought of was high schools, universities, <laughs> and hospitals. The, the ability to, to, to always know where you are, but also be able to call for help or to, to say, hey, there's something happening, come check out my location. Absolutely. So we were actually getting a, a huge influx of, of education response. Unfortunate accidents such as, you know, Sandy Hook in Connecticut have really bring security to the forefront. And a lot of people are really inquiring about, you know, traditional panic buttons. And, you know, traditional panic buttons are great, but they're stationary. So you, you're not always where you need them and stuff like that. With our B4 tag, like I'm showing here, with a quick pull of a tab like I just did. You saw how easy that was. That just notified, for instance, uh, in the form of education, uh, a school lockdown. So for instance, the school resource officer just got a message on the tag. Uh, you may set it up so that every particular student or every teacher would get a message that basically says in lockdown. So now what happened, instead of it being two, three, five minutes before the teachers get the notice, they get it within three to five seconds, and now they can react and, and follow into procedure whatever it is that you know the school wants to put into place. All right, all right. So let's step back a little bit. And actually, because they're still chomping at the bit to know how this works. <laughs> I mean, and I, I, can't, I can't let you off the hook. I, I got to know, what's the tracking mechanism? I, it, it just it just finds signal strength from from arrays, but then it needs to know where the arrays are, right? How do you set up a system like this? So what we do is we have a ECA House site survey, which is a, an industry-wide wireless design analysis troubleshooting, and it's also the tool that we use for our RTLS. So as you walk through the environment on the floor plans, you basically gather the data that's within the the RSSI footprint. So you're in essence learning kind of the RF environment. And then what we're doing is, is through our patented algorithms, we're, we're able to probabilistically determine where they're at. Um, so we use probabilistic math uh, to basically go through and make an, an extremely good uh, location uh, determination based upon a number of factors. You know, where is something supposed to be is part of it, where the RSSI signature strengths that I see are, you know, there's a lot of different things. I mean, the, the algorithms kind of are mathematically way above my head, um, but it works. And that's that's important to know. So this is this is basically Wi-Fi triangulation. <laughs> um, I would say in a, in layman's terms, yes. Um, the thing it's about a, it's that, more complicated than that. I absolutely, understand, because understand. because in, in triangulation, you know, it works really well on, on a one dimension, right. but you start going three dimensionally oh, within a, in any now. kind of multi-floor environment, triangulation by definition doesn't really work that well. So the fact that we're taking into account, you know, like I said, six, eight, 10, 14 different access points, everything that we hear, see, and feel uh, is determined or, or put into that algorithm to be able to determine location. So let me break this down. In order for this to work at, let's say, the Jacob Javits Center, which, you know, we're trying to set up, you would set up your arrays. So we've got these Xerus Wi-Fi arrays, which are fantastic. And then you would do a site survey. You would walk around with your tool and essentially it would measure hotspots, where you have RF, where you don't have RF, where it's strong, what SSIDs are you picking up, what other sources might you be able to detect. And that would let you locate on the map according to that set of parameters where you are in 3D space at any given time. That's pretty much about right, yes. Okay, so I know I know that the people in the chat room, because they're smart people, <laughs> they're going to be wondering, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is basically Wi-Fi, MAC address, SSID information. If someone was already collecting that type of information, like, say, Google or their <laughs> location service, how compatible would your system be with theirs? I mean, would you be able to take a list of SSIDs, a list of, of um, you know, um, RF signatures and be able to expand beyond just a campus that's been already surveyed. So from my experience and in, in, in my uh, my experience with uh, Echo House Solution, I, I really can't answer that question. I would tell you, though, that we're staking, we're staking our name on the location accuracy that we can provide. Right. So relying on other information gathered from third sources would have to be weighed out, and that would be done at, at a production level, you know, which right. I'm not real familiar with. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it basically, you'd have to run their data through your, your system and say, is this precise enough? I mean, are, can we actually give people good location data based on what you may have collected from a moving car? <laughs> right. Now, 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 let me back up one sense and say from the collection aspect, 
uh, I would uh, tend to agree with you where, you know, you may want to have uh, some validation to it. And once again, our site survey tool will gather the data and information. Um, we can't really import because, like I said, we want to rely on, on our information. But you do have the ability to do some proactive checking to see in a particular Wi-Fi environment how accurate you would be. Um, and then be able to go through and, and, like I said, go through and do the survey within the area. So now you not only see uh, what the RF signal strength is, you can predictively say how accurate things should be within the environment. Right. Now show me this. This is the actual interface. So this is what we're setting up right now. We, we started moving in here, what, a, a day or two ago, and, and Wi-Fi arrays are just starting to go up. So you have to build that site survey in order for us to actually use this. How does that work? Show me show me your interface. Okay, so it's actually quite easy. Um, it's a lot easier to, to do the portion that we do. Uh, once again, this is a very uh, in-depth tool. So it has a lot of bells and whistles that can go through from an analysis and the design type. But from an RTLS standpoint, what we do is we basically set up uh, what we call, you know, rails and zones and, and other things to do it. So we take the floor map that is, uh, you know, provided to us from the show. We install it and we walk around and just say, here I am, here I am, here I am, kind of like a traditional uh, survey, except we're not doing like an AP on a stick type survey because the AP is already installed. And as we walk through the area and we design that, we're taking the readings that, that we ultimately come back and are used within our RTLS uh, controller to be able to utilize for location-based services. Right, right. And so here at the Javits, just really quickly, I know that we're going to have to go around. As soon as the Wi-Fi is, is completely up, we're going to have to go around and do that site survey. But once that data is in, what can you expect from these devices? As we put them on the volunteers and on the pieces of gear, what should we be able to see on our status screens here in the NOC? And that's, that's a, an excellent question. So uh, looking at a traditional enterprise where you have walls and rooms and different areas, uh, obviously being here at a trade show, provides uh, a completely different set of challenges. Um, wide open space where there's no RF attenuation, the uniqueness of signal, things like that really come into play. I would say in the educational spaces, we can definitely be room level. Um, my preliminary testing yesterday showed that we could either be in the front of the room or the back of the room, which might be good to know, um, but definitely within the room. When we start getting in at the more common spaces like the uh, the great Crystal Palace out front, <laughs> that is nothing but a huge, great big space of open glass. Um, the location accuracy will be a little bit less granular, but we right. still should be within a space. Now, here's the benefit, too. If there's no walls, if I'm looking for something, I can see it further away than 6, 8, 10 feet, which would be a typical room. So I, I think that we won't have any issues with being able to locate the tags with a reasonable amount of distance. I wish I could give you a finite number, but uh, uh, it's going to be hard to do until we actually get into production state. Okay, I'm going to ask something that's a little bit... A little bit off topic, a little off the wall, but it's, it's, it's in there. And Curtis, back me up on this. Location tracking gets a little tricky when we start getting into the personal space, the, the personal privacy realm. You know, and then that is people don't necessarily like being tracked. Even if I can show you a good reason why you should have one of these, even though I could show you a good reason why your equipment should have this, there's something spooky about being tracked. Uh, Curtis... Talk, talk a little bit about this. In the enterprise, how well do you think a device like this could be accepted? If, if we had one of these tied to every piece of equipment, so we know that laptops are leaving the building, or we know that people are going into areas that they shouldn't be, is, is that an easy sell, or is this something that uh, maybe is not as inevitable as we think it is? Well, I think there are going to be some exceptions. And let me give you one example. Uh, several years ago, one of the companies that had a Wi-Fi analysis system one of the things that they were able to show was exactly where the sources of Wi-Fi signals were. And this was in the time when it was pretty new for laptops to have Wi-Fi capabilities built in. So they were showing me using their office as an example. And you could see all the different laptops moving around. And they were saying, well, here, let us show you this particular executive. Here he is. Oh, look, he's getting up and he's picked up his, his, tab, his uh, notebook and he's moving down the hall. And he's going around the corner, and oh, look, he's going into the men's room. Um, th there is a level at which you get into the too much information point, and tracking someone into a men's room or a ladies' room uh, falls into that category. So I think that within certain parameters, people would be fine with it. 
within certain job categories. People are going to be fine with it. Try to stick one of these in the pocket of the CEO, and I think you've got real problems. Okay, that's actually a really good distinction. Now, Weird Ami in the uh, chat room actually has a good point. He says, well, a, a really common excuse is going to be, uh, oops, I'm sorry, I forgot my big blue box in the office. But what's your business plan for something like this? I mean, obviously, you are not, you don't want to just sell tags. Uh, eventually, are you hoping this technology gets embedded into devices? Well, we're always hoping for stuff like that. Um, but to address a couple of things that just came up, right? So from, a, from a, a vision awareness or our application software, a lot of times where people are concerned about uh, being tracked individually, we can definitely set them up from a generic standpoint where if they're used for staff duress and it doesn't really matter who the end user is, if it's uh, in as far as assets, if it's uh, particular assets, maybe it's a defined number instead of attached to a name. Um, and then when it gets down to being able to just track people in general, you know, that the ability to do it within our software, there's uh, a way to set up permissions so that, of course, not everybody can see where people are. So, you you could have our system set up using our permissions category and be able to say that, you know, Scott and IT has access to the equipment, but, you know, somebody from uh, administration only may have access to people as opposed to others. And it may even be a third party designee that has access to the location of people outside of the alerting aspect, which can proactively bring help. Okay. I want to give you the final word. Looking at this kind of type of technology, um, I would say it's inevitable. I mean, I, I think tracking data is something that the enterprise has sorely wanted for the longest time because you know it gives us everything from security to productivity tools to real-time communication tools anytime we have like a campus situation or a hospital situation but well, where do you want to see this tech in you know three to five years how do you want to see it roll out where would you like to see Ekahau leverage itself in order to uh, you know give this uh, a real shot at becoming the norm well, we're already gaining a lot of ground. I mean, it's really becoming a lot more acceptance. Uh, once we get into things like uh, education, like we talked about earlier, and, and unfortunate, uh, you know, in education, it, it took a drastic event uh, to happen. But within healthcare, the whole process of having to be more efficient and, and do things with less. And, you know, if you can't find your equipment, you know, how you have to buy more. So being able to really streamline processes, being able to uh, identify workflow issues, uh, being able to fix that stuff really requires some kind of location tracking because without it, you, there's no way to validate kind of what's going on uh, within your environment. So I would probably say it, it's gaining a lot of ground. Uh, there's always room uh, for more. Um, so that's uh, where we see it. Scott, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you for coming on to This Week in Enterprise Tech. We are going to be uh, wandering around with uh, your rack of goodies here. Oh, it's all white. I can't really see it. But, but And we're going to try it out at Interop and see if perhaps we can get some really good location data. But uh, until that happens, can you tell the good folks at home where they can find out more about you, about Ekahau, about how real-time location services could work for them? Absolutely. Our website has uh, got a lot of information, including contact information. Uh, it's www.ekahau.com. We're also on LinkedIn. We're on Twitter. Um, or on Facebook, uh, as well as uh, some other uh, media stations. So it's definitely, we're out there, we're visible, just uh, look us up. Hey, Curtis, tell me a little bit about what's going on at Enterprise Efficiency. I know we're, we've got some collaborative work going on, and uh, you want to play at Interop, so tell me how they find all that goodness. Well, they can look, first of all, at some archive interop radio shows that we did. We did some previews and had some great stuff. Go to www.enterpriseefficiency.com, look for E2 Radio. And on Thursday, uh, that's October 3rd, at 10 a.m. Eastern, you and I will be talking about what's going on on the show floor at Interop. I'm going to be here in the swamp. You're going to be right there in the Network Operations Center that should be a great conversation because you will have had a chance to see what's actually happening and you'll get to tell me all about it. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to thank everyone who made this show possible because, you know, again, yeah, you've hit that hour mark. You've used up another hour of your life listening to the best dang enterprise show in the universe. That's according to nine out of 10 moms. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who go into making this possible. Of course, there's my super producer, Karsten. Of course, there's there's Jason, my TD, who, oh, by the way, I, I believe he 
he has a show, right? I mean, Jason, you don't just sit behind that desk all day. I think you do one of the best dang Android podcasts in the world. In fact, it, it might be entirely about Android. What, what's that thing called? All about Android. Tuesdays, twit.tv slash AAA. Be there. Be there. Be there. That's right. Be there or he will root your Android device. <laughs> now, I also want to talk to you. That's right. The Twyat Right, the loyal members of our audience who come back week after week to get the goodness about the hotness that is enterprise tech. Now, did you know that we want you to have every episode of the show in your device of choice? And so we make it easy for you to do it. If you go right now to our show page at twit.tv slash Twyat, you'll find a little drop down menu, a little, a little magic button that will allow you to automatically download This Week in Enterprise Tech to your iPod, to your iPad, to your Android tablet or phone, to your zombie Zoom. Basically, any device you have, we want you to have Twyat in it. That's right, Twyat, we're inside you. Also, did you know that we've got a YouTube page? If you go to youtube.com slash Twyat, you'll be able to find not only all of our episodes, but you'll be able to find the little segments, Stuff My IT Guy Says, replays of the data closet, pro gear and pro tip, all the little vignettes that will help you to learn more about how the world is connected. It's what we promise. It's what we deliver. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. If you follow me, you can actually comment on each episode and suggest possible themes and topics for future episodes. It's where we get a lot of our episodes from. In fact, the last one that we did on security, on, on hacking, on using Metasploit, came straight from Twitter. So join Twitter, follow me, and help me to figure out what you want to see on the next episode of Twyat. Thanks again to CyberDog, who helps us out with the show notes. Everyone back at the Brick House, I'm Father Robert Balnacer. And remember, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep Twyat.